Phones are off. Let me get the slate. Marker, good. Great. Any more, Tony? Alec, thank you for doing this. You, you haven't said much in public since that tragic accident. Why, why speak out now? Well, I think that um, there's a criminal investigation. That could be a while. Uh, there's all kinds of civil litigation. And I felt there were a number of misconceptions, most of it from sources I really wouldn't concern myself about but a couple that I did concern myself about, where there were these authoritative statements about, oh, this is what happened. The Sheriff's Department hasn't even released a report to the DA yet. The reason I wanted to sit down with you is because I really feel like I can't wait for that process to fit to end in February, March. I mean, I'm not asking them to speed it up for my benefit, that's ridiculous. But I am saying that they're gonna do what they need to do, and I wanted to come to talk to you to say that I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I think the big question, and the one you must have asked yourself a thousand times, how could this have happened? Well, there's two things I want to say about that. One is that when I talk about this, my concern is that I don't sound like I'm the victim. Because there is a victim. There's a woman who died, and my friend got shot. He's my friend. And she was a new friend. I met her and we worked together on the, some of the mapping out of what we we're gonna do on the film, which, you know, in the movie terms, if you go make a movie with Scorsese, you and the DP don't sit down and they solicit your ideas of how to make the film, you know what I mean? In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had. But um, I, I, I wanna make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty, other than those, you know, uh, dummy rounds. I want to get into more detail on the day in a minute, but let's take a step back. What was it that drew you to this project in the first place, to rust? I'd worked on a project with Joel before. Joel Susan, the Susan, director. Right, he, he did this movie, Crown Vic, that I produced. And uh, Joel and I stayed in touch, we're friends, and I loved Russ. He, he said, I want to send you this. And I read it and I said, I love it, I love it. Rust, a low-budget Western, tells the story of an aging outlaw on the run with his young grandson. Baldwin, the film's star, is also one of the producers. Very excited. Very, very, so excited that we finally got this made because every independent film has many false starts. You know, what I mean? and when it finally goes, you finally get, you feel like a plane. When you finally get some lift under your wings, it's very, very gratifying. I am a purely creative producer. My authorities as a producer are casting and script, which are actually married to the role of being a lead actor in a film. So you're not the kind of producer who's looking at the line item of each budget. No, 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 no. They're, they're, they're basically. Two types of producers who are, who are really in charge of production. People that raise the money and the people who spend the money. My consultations or approvals were completely about casting and about the script. I don't hire anybody in the crew. I don't Not even me. the cinematographer, no one? No, no, but he will apprise me of what he's doing. And he'll say to me, I got Helena Hutchins to be the DP. I said, oh, how do you feel about that? Are you excited? I'm very excited. She's wonderful. What did you know about Helena Hutchins before she started working on this? I knew nothing about her until Joel said to me, I got her. She was fantastic. Helena Hutchins, the talented cinematographer praised by many in the industry, was a trailblazer in the field historically dominated by men. Make sure we don't see people walking around like walking around. Ready? Action. The Ukrainian-born cinematographer quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. but admired by everybody who, um, who worked with her. Russ' 21-day production began filming on October 6th at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, just outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. The ranch has long been a favorite location for filming Westerns. 
We need a place to lay low. Things have a way of escalating out here in the West with one thing leading to another. The day that I flew there, they'd been shooting for a week already. I come the following week on the 11th. That night of the 11th, I had dinner with Helena and Joel. And we talked about some of the compositions I was thinking of to... Uh, that was the first time you met? First time I met Helena, yeah. What was your first impression? When I met her, I knew she had that spark. I knew she had that flint to her, that she was gonna get that day's work done and get the shots that she wanted. She was very focused. She had a vision for she the She was very focused. We had a discussion about compositions of shots in which you were shooting these beautiful tableaus of the West. She had that intensity. Every day you went to work, she would say, good morning, how are you? How was your evening? Boom, it was small talk, go. We weren't gonna hang out and, and chit chat or whatever. She knew that the clock was the enemy and we have to move forward. Once on set, Baldwin posts this video. I wanna say, I look at myself in the mirror, a reflection of this, and I'm really kind of appalled. It's appalling. But we're here shooting a film, we start tomorrow, and, um, uh, and no, I'm not playing Santa Claus. On the 12th, I had a safety demonstration with Hannah Reed, the armorer. 24-year-old Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, seen here in photos by the DailyMail.com, was hired as the film's armorer, in charge of all weapons on set. The daughter of a famous Hollywood armorer, Russ was only her second film in this role. She spoke to the Voices of the West podcast about working as lead armorer for her first film before Rust. I was really nervous about it at first and I almost didn't take the job because I wasn't sure if I was ready, but doing it, like, it went really smoothly. We spent an hour and a half shooting the pistol, her giving me all her safety instructions. Did you think she was up to the job? I assumed because she was there and she was hired, she was, she was up for the job. And nothing she did raised any red flags with you? No. Okay. This, this training course you do, what did she tell you? She said things like, remember, this is, a, this is a blank round, so you have to create the discharge yourself because there's no projectile. So if you shot the gun, you go bang. When you roll the camera, you gotta go bang and have the gun, gun snap back. You have to create that. She would give you little tips about firing, and she'd say to you, you know, when we're done, point the gun down. When we're done, you give the gun to me or to Halls, only those two people. Dave Halls was Rust's assistant director, also known as the first AD. Seen here in this IMDB photo, he was responsible for keeping the production on schedule. Sometimes we would be on a set that was a very, very cramped set, and they wanted people in that room on an as-needed basis. If I'm holding the gun and they say cut, I then hand the gun to Halls if she's not there. Yeah, why Halls, not Hannah? Some people have said that only the armorer should be handling it. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's inaccurate, meaning in, 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 in the protocols of the business, meaning Hannah would to hand me the gun 99% of the time, no, whatever, the, the preponderance of the time. But when we would say cut, if Hannah was away from the set, I would hand Halls the gun. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed had a dual role on set, armorer, and she was also the assistant prop master for the film. One of the things her attorney has said is that she was hired for two positions on the film and therefore was stretched in an inappropriate way. Did she raise any of those concerns with you? No, I assume that everyone who's shooting a lower budget film uh, is stretched, myself included. And I, I, I got no complaints from her or the prop department. I'm not sitting there when I'm getting dressed and ready to go do a scene saying, oh my God, the prop woman seemed very harried today. I didn't get a sense of that from, from, from any of the, 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 the people on the film. The first time I heard that there was any problem with anybody uh, in the crew of the film was when Luber said, well, we have some issues here. Lane Looper, the first camera assistant, would email production managers a resignation letter later that night citing safety concerns. Quote, during the filming of gunfights on this job, things are often played very fast and loose. So far, there have been two accidental weapons discharges. He also wrote about concerns about reasonable rest and housing for local crew with long commutes to the set. When he quit, now, the day before that happened, we wrapped, and he came up to me and he said, thank you for the position you've taken on behalf of IATSE and the union on social media. I said, my pleasure. This photo, posted by Helena, showed the cast and crew in solidarity with IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which had been on the verge of a strike, 
and Alec posted this on Instagram. And I want to say to the people in IATSE, do what you need to do. You want to go on strike? Go on strike. Because I'll tell you something about the executives. They don't give a about you. He said, because we have some issues here. I said, such as? And he said, my men need a better hotel room. There was no mention of safety issues. He didn't say anything about the accidental he discharges on set? He didn't say anything about anything. He goes, my men need better hotel rooms. I said, well, we're leaving, we're wrapping. Will you be here tomorrow? He said, yes. Because what I was about to do, which I've done on any number of films and TV projects, was to give more of the, my salary back to the production to pay for X. And I was about to say to him, let me know what it would be to be and be you guys in a house that's closer to the, how we can address your problem. I will be happy to contribute to, to that. The next day they were gone. So you had no sense from anyone on the set that people had been stretched to the point where safety was compromised? No, no. I never heard one word about that, none. Russ producers told ABC News Mr. Looper's allegations around budget and safety are patently false, which is not surprising, considering his job was to be a camera operator and he had absolutely nothing to do with or knowledge of safety protocols or budgets. Safety is always the number one priority on our films. When people say cutting costs, I don't say this with any judgment or any cynicism. Spielberg wants to save money. Tom Cruise wants to save money. Everybody who makes movies has a responsibility not to be reckless and careless with the money that you're given. We know that those are men who make movies that cost $205 million. And I'm making movies that cost $5 million. Or the question, pounds. though, is were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? Well, in, in, my, in my opinion, no, because I did not, now, I did not observe any safety or security issues at all in the time I was there. Thursday, October 21st, Baldwin posts a photo of himself in costume on Instagram. Back to in-person at the office, blimey, it's exhausting. That morning, Looper and six other crew members walked off the set. Filming continued with a replacement camera crew. Scene 118 in the church was slated for after lunch. Everybody there was having a positive experience. People who are watching the show, people who are back home, you have no idea how unique an environment a motion picture set is. It's kind of, there's an instant familiarity. The amount of care, these are people who are professionals who have really good jobs in a field they love. And I looked at all these people and, and I see how hard they work. They're so hardworking and they're so conscientious. And you're around people, and you're part of one of the great collaborative processes in the world, movie making. Everyone moving like a watch to get everything done. And when you kind of, I, I don't make that many movies anymore. Because movie making demanded that I travel. And I didn't want to leave my family. All these movies I made, I stayed home. I didn't want to go, if I went away, I went away for a week. To leave my family for four weeks and go shoot this movie, shoot this movie, that was a big deal. And I'm sitting on this, this pew. And so help me God, I sat on that pew right before they called lunch and I said, this movie has made me love making movies again. Because I used to love to make movies. I did. You know, I worked with people once. I was going to do the movie The Edge. And uh, they called me and said they got Tony Hopkins to do the film. What do you make of it? Yeah, look if we're here. And I started sobbing. I just started sobbing because I thought, oh God, I mean, I'm gonna have a chance to work with this guy. Any chance you can go easy on me? When they cast me in It's Complicated with Meryl, I thought, I'm gonna get to go make a movie with her. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> sorry. You know, people, they have their dreams. No matter how old you are, you have your dreams of people you wanna work with. And this movie made me Love making movies again. I really thought we were onto something. It was the 12th day of their 21 day shoot. 
That day, I did exactly what I've done every day on that movie. Baldwin was preparing for his next scene, a shootout inside this wooden church. Set the scene right before that happened. You're sitting in a pew in the church. Right. What's the scene supposed to be? The scene is the two, two guys are there who have got me, uh, uh, you know, cornered, and they think I'm shot pretty bad, and I'm kind of wilting, and they, uh, they have a gun, and then the sound outside distracts them, and I then draw the gun out, cross draw out of my holster, pull the gun up like that, and start to cock the pistol cut. I'm handed a gun, and someone declares, they said, this is a cold gun. Dave Halls? The, 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 the first AD. In my years on the sets of film, hot gun meant that there was a charge in there, and cold gun meant there was nothing in there. When he's saying this, this is a cold gun, what he's saying to everybody on the set is you can relax. The gun is empty. That's and what cold gun means. Well, cold gun means there's no charge in there. There could be dummy rounds. A dummy round looks like a real bullet, but it's completely inert. It contains no explosive charge. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal, where I'm gonna show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this, you're me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels, and she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out, and I find a mark. I draw the gun out, I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. So if you're shooting directly into the camera lens, you're not aiming I'm not at shooting her. into the camera lens. I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right, in her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. That was what I was told, I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. But we kept doing this, and so then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm gonna cock the gun. And I said, do you wanna see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not gonna pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun, I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. At the moment. The that was moment. the moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger at them. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. And Hall's attorney told ABC News that he was watching and agrees that Alec did not pull the trigger and that his finger was outside the trigger guard. So you have this cold 45, you just pulled? The hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual And you're gun. holding onto the hammer. I'm holding that, I'm just showing, I go, how about that? Does that work? Do you see that? Do you see that? You see that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer, bang, the gun goes off. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in, no one was, the gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? The notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Well, she's laying there and I go, did she get hit by wadding? Was there a blank, sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs, it's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you back I went away? up to her and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. 911, what's the location of your emergency? We need a net, we need an ambulance out at Bonanza Creek Ranch right now. We've got two people shot on a movie set accidentally. I'll connect you with medical dispatch. Don't hang up. 
Director Joel Souza is also wounded, his shoulder hit by the same bullet that traveled through Helena. When she went down, he went down, and he was screaming really loudly. And I thought, well, what is he screaming? What happened? So was it loaded with a real bullet or one? I, I cannot tell you that. Okay. We have two injuries from a movie gun shot. Okay. We're getting him out there already. Just stay on the phone with me. Thank you. Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that, the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She was in the church, and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. Did it, you was, know? it wasn't until I was in the police station. Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers, at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a 45 caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer, said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the kind of insanity-inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. Tonight, breaking news. A fatal shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's new movie in New Mexico. Something went horribly wrong here in Santa Fe. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of, she was laying there and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was gonna be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. Shock and grief. Helena's husband, Matthew, posted a tribute to Helena. Helena inspired us all with her passion and vision, and her legacy is too meaningful to encapsulate in words. Our loss is enormous. When this happened, her husband comes to town, her husband Matthew, and I met with him and their son. And he was as kind as you could be. What can you possibly say to him? The, 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 I didn't know what to say. He, he hugged me and he goes, he goes, I, I suppose you and I are going to go through this together, he said. And I thought, well, not as much as you are, you know. And his little boy is there who's nine years old. I have, I have six kids now. I have my older daughter, Ireland. But of the six kids that Ilaria and I have, my oldest is eight. I have a nine-month-old baby. And I think to myself, this little boy um, doesn't have a mother anymore. And I know that in my life, I'm with my kids, and I'm doing quite well with my kids. My kids and I are having a great time, right until my wife walks in the room, and then I become invisible. My kids all go and they uh, uh, jump on top of their mother. And this boy doesn't have a mother anymore. And, um, and there's nothing we can do to bring her back. And I told him, I said, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know how to convey to you how sorry I am and how I'm willing to do anything I can to cooperate. In the aftermath of the shooting, a torrent of criticism. The first thing you do when you pick up that gun is you make sure 
uh, that it's never pointed at anybody. He, he should have known that an AD handing you a gun and saying it's cold isn't the same as several people showing you an empty gun. If I were holding that gun, I would have checked it, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. People said to me, I mean, I, I got countless people online saying, you, you idiot, you never point a gun at someone. Well, unless you're told it's empty and it's the director of photography who's instructing you on, on the angle for a shot we're gonna do. And she and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty and it wasn't. And that's not her responsibility, that's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. But I do, well, there but are I, some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set, no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me where to point the gun for her camera angle. That's exactly what happened. That day I did exactly what I've done every day of, uh, on that movie. Which is what? Which is that there's an armorer there, and, and that word is new to me. In the years I've been in this What did you call it? It was a prop guy or woman. And the prop person would come and sometimes they would insist on demonstrating for you and the camera crew. They take the gun, if it was a contemporary gun, they show you the chamber, they show you the clip, they say, the gun is cold. And you look at it and go, thank you. And in the 40 years- Sometimes that would happen. Not all the time. Well, but no, no, sometimes they wouldn't demonstrate to me. Some insisted on demonstrating. They would do the demonstration for everybody there right before we rolled the camera or rehearsed. Then there were others who they didn't do that because I trusted them to do the job. And again, this is not just me pointing a gun at somebody else, people pointing guns at me. Well, I, I've gotten shot and killed in films before where people had to shoot a flash round at me and I trusted them to do their job. And in the 40 years I've been in this business, all the way up until that day, I never had a problem. How many times do you think you handled a gun in those 40 years? Oh God, I don't know, I don't know. What, what amazes me is how many bullets, how many rounds of bullets do you believe have been fired on the sets of movies and TV shows in the last 75 years? No idea. Right, it could even be, be above a billion. You've had hundreds and hundreds of millions of bullets fired on the sets of films and TV shows, and four or five people were killed. Now those deaths are, are, are tragic and abhorrent, and believe me, I would do anything in my power. I would do anything in my power to undo what was done. I don't know how that bullet arrived in that gun, I don't know. But I'm all for doing anything that will take us to a place where we're, it's, this is less likely to happen again. Every single time I'm handed a gun on a set, every time, Mark, they hand me a gun, I look at it, I open it, I show it to the person I'm pointing it to, we show it to the crew, every yeah. single take, you hand it back to the armor when you're done, you do it again. Right. Everyone does it. Everybody knows it. How do you respond to actors like George Clooney who say that every time they were handed a gun, they checked it themselves? Well, there were a lot of people who felt it necessary to contribute some comment to the situation, which really didn't help the situation at all. You have your, if your protocol is you check the gun every time, well, good for you, good for you. You know what I mean? I probably handled weapons as much as any other actor in films with, with an average career. Again, shooting or being shot by someone. And in, in, in that time, I had a protocol and it never let me down. Why did you choose in your 40 years not to check the gun yourself? What I was taught by someone years ago was, as I said, if I, if I took a gun, and I popped a clip out of a gun, or I manipulated the chamber of a gun, they would take the gun away from me and redo it. The prop person said, don't do that, when I was young. And they'd say, one thing you would need to understand is we don't want the actor to be the last line of defense against a catastrophic breach of safety with the gun. My job, they told me, man or woman, my job is to make sure the gun is safe and then I hand you the gun and I declare the gun safe. The crew's not relying on you to say that it's safe. They're relying on me to say that it's safe. When that person who was charged with that job handed me the weapon, I trusted them and, and I never had a problem. And ever. this was from the beginning of your career? F from day one. There's one person that's supposed to make sure that what is in the gun is right and that it's, what's wrong is not in the gun. One person has that responsibility to maintain the gun. And what is the actor's responsibility? I guess that's a, that's a tough question because the actor's responsibility going this day forward is very different than it was the day before that. Yeah, now, now I can't, first of all, I can't imagine I'd ever do a movie that had a gun in it again. And um, I can't. When you say what is the actor's responsibility, the actor's responsibility 
is to do what the prop armorer tells them to do. And we did not have a problem. I mean, I understand there was an accidental discharge at one point on the set of a blank round, but we did not have a problem for me until that day. Everything gets slowed down as a Pruder film-esque here. And the issue with that is, is there's only one question to be resolved, only one. That is, where did the live round come from?